Well, Marie, uh, good evening and welcome to the Opportunities Party uh, Education Session Q&A with Dr. Naomi Pocock and myself. Kia ora, Naomi. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I've just resettled my third child, so hopefully he's going to go to sleep now. Nice. And you're beaming to us from uh, Hamilton at the moment? Yes, I am. How is it? in the Tron? Yeah, good. We've had a lovely day here today. It's been beautiful and sunny and I've been out doing my flyers and getting a bit of exercise. So it's been really nice. Fantastic. And so, and you are Dr. Naomi Pocock. Um, can you, can you uh, tell us what, what uh, got your, got you through to your illustrious title? What do you, what are you a doctor of? Um, well, <laughs> philosophy, I guess. Doctor of Philosophy, not a medical doctor, so don't don't fall over, Jeff. I won't be able to help you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I did a PhD uh, on concepts of home and belongingness and identity construction, and um, sort of quite a post-disciplinary thesis. So looking beyond the borders of an individual discipline at the concepts itself of home and etc. Um, and but the context at the time was. Um, the return from long-term travel. So people have made a home for themselves elsewhere and then they return to New Zealand and it's not necessarily their home anymore. They might be physically here, but socially, emotionally, they're elsewhere. So that was the context, but um, sort of those understandings of how we build an identity and our sense of belonging and, you know, within ourselves and with others and our environment, et cetera, that translates quite nicely over to education because obviously our children, as they develop, are, figuring that all out as well. Absolutely. And that's really is the bedrock. Belonging is the bedrock of our mental health, isn't it? I mean, it uh, is. which which is a good segue into our early childhood education <laughs> policy. But I don't want to take that segue just yet, Naomi, because I just wanted to say, so you mentioned putting your youngest to bed, I think it was, or your third child to bed. I don't know if that's the eldest or the youngest. Um, so you have, and you have, Three, three kids, three boys? I do, yes. And they are all in bed, so that's good. Uh, so <laughs> I've got three boys. They are nine, nearly eight, and just turned six. Awesome. So, yeah. So just after I did my thesis, I started having my children, and uh, that was quite intense for a while. And then uh, I went to play centre. That was my saviour. Learned all about child development and you know, with Play Centre, you get to do education. So I did more education. I can't get enough of the education. And now I'm learning all about top party policy. So that's really interesting too. Yeah. So as soon as your three kids went to school, you thought, well, what, what can I do now? I'll become a politician. Oh, no, I did not. I did <laughs> You're not a glutton for punishment. No, I did not think that, Jeff. And as you well know, I, um, so, you know, 2017, I was sort of starting to freak out about their future. They were three years younger than they are now. And we biked around delivering pamphlets for top uh, as, a, as a little group. That was fun for them. And, uh, but, you know, that was all I could really do at that stage with two. I think only two of them were, one of them was at school. And then, um, so this time around, yeah, all of them are at school. So I have got a bit more time. And, you know, we've had some conversations and uh, I've been convinced to uh, expose myself to the public for the, for the good of, of the nation. I mean, I'm very passionate, obviously, about TOP and uh, all the evidence-based policy. And, um, you know, it was a bit of an uncomfortable journey to go, I'm going to put my face all around town, but I'm here now and, and it's okay. It's, it's about... It's bigger than me and my feelings, and uh, that's what I have to keep telling myself on an almost daily basis. And the gateway drug was you writing our early childhood, uh, early childhood education policy, which I, I have to the people at public at home should know. That was how Naomi got hooked into it, um, <clears throat> and it's an incredible policy. If you have um, time to check it out, it's uh, it's sixty pages, but there is there is a uh, a summary. Uh, we often joke about, uh, you know, people talking about how great it is that the Greens have got a 50 page manifesto where it's like, well, we've got more than that. We've got more detail than that and just one policy. <laughs> yes, so, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a mini thesis. I mean, I spent a year and a half researching and, um, you know, listening or well, reading all the research and finding out what the experts say, because as I said before, 
even though I know about concepts of belongingness and home, I really didn't know a lot about the sort of the education literature. So I did a lot of research and gathered that all together to develop the policy. And um, prior to that, I read all of TOPS policies and that was the only bit that I disagreed with. So I'm like, I'm gonna <laughs> fix this and then I'm away. Fantastic. Um, I do agree with your cannabis policy, Jeff. There you go. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, let's not get started on that because because uh, that that could that could take the hour. Um, <clears throat> so fantastic, Naomi. So look, folks at home, if you have questions about our education policy, feel free to start sending them in. But we are Naomi and I just are just going to spend ten minutes now, just really talking about things at a high level. So let's just kick us off, Naomi. What yeah. is wrong with the status quo on in our education system right now? Yeah. Okay, so basically for decades, under both national and labour, we've created a system that no longer trusts its teachers. A system that values testing over learning and compliance over teaching. And a system that, you know, measures mo constant measuring and monitoring of progress in order to figure out where to put its funding. And so... We're saying the education system is broken and it's breaking our teachers and our students. Now, as we've just talked about, TOP isn't about creating policy that tinkers around the edges to meet a three-year election cycle. We're into doing thorough research and creating uh, you know, visionary policy that will take New Zealand forwards. So our education vision isn't gonna happen overnight or perhaps even in three years. But without the vision, we're never going to get there. And so we think that there is a different way that we could be doing education in New Zealand. We could be letting education do education because education is actually the life pulse of our society. So there is a better way. We think that we could create a high trust system, one that's a bit like Finland, one that values its teachers. And that's what we're aiming to do. We know where to invest. And we don't need piece of test results to tell us where to invest our money. We need to invest in communities that have been under-resourced in the past. We need to invest in the social and emotional development of our children. We need to invest in, a quality, in quality professional development for our staff. None of us spend a, time, spend a day at a workshop and then go, that was a waste of time. That's what's happening at the moment. We don't want any more of that. We want quality professional development. We want suitable pay for our for a well-trained profession, and we want to make changes in the system to enable learning to flourish. So if we think about our children that are going to be starting school this year, they're going to be retiring after 2080. Now, we don't know what the nature of work is going to look like in 2040, let alone 2080. So what we're trying to do is develop resilient children who can adapt to their disrupted future. And, and that, and that really that, does that really does bring us back to your PhD, doesn't it? Because preparing citizens for the future really is all about belonging. Uh, you know, all of that social and emotional stuff that you were that you were talking about. Yeah. 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 We we you know we want people to feel connected to themselves and to others and to their communities. Absolutely. And also we want our kids in order to sort of be, be ready and resilient for this adapt for this future, this disrupted future that they're going to be facing. We need them to be developing soft skills. So, you know, artificial or automation, artificial intelligence is going to come in and take away a lot of the work. But those soft skills like communication, collaboration, critical thinking and creativity, those human skills are what? you know, our children need to be developing. And so, this starts, and this really does start right back at that early childhood time, doesn't it? I mean, we are developing those skills very much, well, even even before then with, with the parent. Well, that's right. And, you know, the brain science talks about uh, children not really being ready for that structured formal learning until they're about seven on average as a population. And that, you know, Obviously, kids are different, and it depends on birth order and gender, et cetera. But just in general, as a population, you overall not ready for that really formal structured learning until about seven. Their brains are still in that social and emotional 
development phase prior to seven. And so we're saying, you know, we need to be recognizing that, not bringing down the structured learning into ECEs, but pushing up the more play-based learning into schools is how we want to sort of fix that bit. So when parents are saying, <clears throat> you know, things like, uh, you know, because because what what I mean, what you're really talking about, all this sort of stuff is just impossible to 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 measure on an objective test, isn't it? I mean, there's no way to, um, uh, I mean, the the very concept of of collaboration, for example, can't be tested by put, yeah. by putting a child at a desk and getting them to do something individual. I mean, it's, it's complete right. anathema. Yes, so, and, and yeah, that's right. And the same with creativity. Like the OECD is starting to decide on what the criteria for creativity are. You know, tick box scenario. Here's a certificate. Congratulations, you're creative. That is not how creativity works, or collaboration, or any of those skills. It's about providing um, opportunity, providing opportunity for children to practice those things, and then facilitating the learning through it. And those opportunities need to be provided in a variety of contexts. So that includes in, indoors in the classroom, doing a variety of you know, activities. Also outdoors, all, all different contexts. Because what they've found with people, say, for example, who are in, you know, in the profession, are wonderfully creative in one industry, then they shift them over to another industry and they totally fail. So you need to have that variety of context in order to build up those skills so that it's not sort of just singular. Yeah. So when parents sort of talk about, because I mean, the the anxiety that comes up for people with the sort of system that we're talking about, the the kind of the Finnish system is that they, is that they a lot of a lot of parents respond well, but I want to know how my child is doing. How, yeah. You know, how do they compare to others? Or, or, yeah. And it's and it's kind of it's almost like the whole mindset uh, that we've got with regards to education is 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 just wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, well, when you listen to the experts, when you listen to the experts in education, like Sir Ken Robertson, who unfortunately just died, but he's got some fantastic TED talks out there. When you listen to them, education. At learning, learning at its core, isn't about competition. It's about social interaction. And so, you know, there is a place for testing and there is a place for assessment in terms of diagnostics. But when we create a whole system that is getting all these, you know, comparative, comparing everybody, that, that's really not, not um, celebrating the nature of learning. So the nature of learning is interactional. It's you know emotional. When we feel heightened emotions, we tend to the learning tends to sink deeper into us. It's embodied. You know, it's practical. When we're into the learning, doing thing, doing stuff, not just filling out a worksheet. That's when the learning sinks into us. It involves failure. We need to celebrate failure. There's a lot of you know innovative people who are saying in New Zealand we don't celebrate failure enough. So, it, you know, it is a big mind shift. And, mm. you know, as Sir Ken Robinson also talked about the gatekeepers of success in education, literacy and numeracy have been given such a heightened status for so long to the detriment of much of the rest of our curriculum, like the outdoors, outdoor education, humanities, the arts have all sort of fallen away. They haven't as badly in New Zealand as he was talking about in the States, but they are sort of falling away. And, mm. you know, when really learning is about, you know, the self and the, and we're all different. We're all different. Yeah. And that's the beauty of being human. Can I, can I try an analogy with you? Yeah. And folks at home, I've never tried this with Naomi before. So this is being pioneered on a Facebook live before everyone. Okay. So <clears throat> I've often, and I've often thought, thought about this but I've never said it to you before so to me the point of an education system is we're trying to create an ecosystem we're trying to we're trying to create an ecosystem where where everyone's different you know the wet has got a job and the and the and the ruru the more pork's got got their job and the uh and the kiwi has got their job 
Uh, and, and everyone's different, but they're all great at what they do within this ecosystem. But what testing tries to do is it says, right, okay, right. Kiwi, Weta, Ruru, we're going to have a flying contest. <laughs> we're going to measure you on how fast you can fly from this tree to this tree. And it's like, why? <laughs> why do we care how fast the kiwi, the kiwi can't fly? <laughs> It's got another job, yeah. you know, it's good at something else. <laughs> to me, it's about finding what people are, are, are good at, creating an ecosystem which has different skills rather than comparing everyone on these arbitrary things that we can measure them on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that is a really good analogy, Jeff. You're very clever. And oh, also, you've clearly been it. listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> I have, um, I have, I have. But also, you know, that is a bit similar to Ken Robinson, again, who talks about, um, you know, creating the conditions for learning to flourish and basing that on the agricultural system rather than the industrial age, which is where our education system has come from. So, yeah. Talk yeah, more about so, that. What do you mean basing it on the agricultural system? Well, so creating conditions where learning can flourish. So, you know, like he likens it to, he tells a story about Death Valley, which is where he, you know, near where he lives, where everything's dead most of the time and it never rains there. But then this one year, the rain fell and all these little seedlings came to life on, in one spring. And so what he's saying is that the seedlings are all there and they just need watering, you know? So just, yeah, so looking creating after, yeah. caring for, creating the conditions for learning to flourish. It's there, it's ready. People are naturally curious. You know, we're all diverse and we're interested while kids are, kids start off very interested. If you think yeah. about zero fives, they're so engaged and they're learning and interested in the world and it's all very exciting. And yeah. then it gets knocked out of them by yeah. the system. It's yeah. gutting. And it's not the teacher's fault. The teachers are there trying to, you know, encourage them to learn. It's the system that needs changing. Because our system is not, is, as I said before, it's breaking the teachers. You know, there's too much compliance, too much of this measuring, testing. We need yeah. to let go of that. Yeah. And, and you know, we'll feel free to, feel free to uh, you know, throw in, um, you know, you know uh, diversions whenever you like, Naomi. But I'm going to start throwing questions at you too. Because this is, this, your point you just made links very well to one of the questions we've had from Craig. Beginning teachers are meant to have individual guidance, professional development, and support for their first two years. This can be very hit and miss, and the quality varies from school to school. How can mm. we support beginning teachers better to stop the extreme drop-off in the first two, five, and ten years? Mm. So what Craig is talking about is this incredible issue that New Zealand has where we, we hear so much about a teacher shortage, but we actually train tons of teachers. It's just that mm. they don't stick around. They leave the industry so quickly because, oh, well, let me, you know, I'll let you talk about about why. why I mean, why well, why is that? Well, I, I, I mean, I can imagine that if you, like, like with any um, job, if you sort of go in for a reason, which usually people st are teachers because they love the kids and they want to, you know, engage with the kids and they want to teach the kids and they want to, you know, get these kids excited about learning. And then you go into the system or the or the workplace and it's not like that at all. You know, it's all about the compliance and the regulation and the tick boxing and the error coming in and making sure you're doing it all right and all of that stuff. And you don't really have time or the capacity to build close relationships with these kids and you've got so many in your classroom many of them have learning challenges as well which isn't also supported and they're not well trained to deal with that so it's just like I mean I would leave too I'd be going, that's not what that's not what I'm here for you know so mm. so so valuing valuing the the art of teaching if you like and um mm. you know that whole mentoring at the start education hub recently put up a webinar which is all around the nature of training and education and encouraging a more coaching um, approach so mm. it's not like some, going and sitting in a classroom and being told what you should be doing but more of a an interactive sort of coaching 
and a mm. self-reflective, but also reflecting on your practice and then working with somebody that you trust, whether that's within your school or outside your school, to give you some, you know, feedback and some coaching. Um, you know, I think that's a that's a better mechanism than and, um, and it totally makes sense too, right? Because we want to, our teachers to be role modeling lifelong learning because that's what we're asking yeah. our students to do. So actually, I mean, and I, I, you know, spent a bit of time in Finland a couple of years ago and, and the, the thing that they really impressed on me was because everyone over there needs to do a master's in, in education to be a, a teacher. Mm. And the thing with the master's course was it's all about teaching you to learn, to be a lifelong learner. Mm. And so teachers are, are <clears throat> teachers are given a variety of concepts or ways of approaching things, but they're ultimately given the skills to say, well, try this and here's how you see if it's working. And if it's not working, try this and keep, yeah. you know, and keep experimenting. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And all that self-reflection. And we probably shouldn't delve too deeply into tertiary, but you and I have talked before, Jeff, about how the master's courses are where the good stuff happens. That could be yeah. brought back into the bachelor level. And then like what we're saying, kids should be learning that self-reflective, critical thinking practice right from early on. And it's yeah. not about being critical of yourself, but it's about thinking. It's metacognition. So thinking about thinking. Oh, yeah. noticing how you yeah. like knowing how you learn like how many of us get taught in school how we learn you know do yeah. we ever, we might find that out later but but yeah so and, so and in a very supportive supportive environment right from early on yeah then we could yeah then the masters might be happening at the uh you know at the bachelor's level that's right yeah hey so there's an a, a conversation erupting online about PD, uh, which is, this is really fascinating. Um, <laughs> this sometimes happens on live streams that, that the people discussing things on the live stream goes off, uh, you know, they go off on their own tangent. So there's quite a big debate happening, Naomi, about people saying, well, there are currently alternative PD models that are funded by the ministry. Yeah. Um, but there's other people saying, but not, not, but that widely that varies so widely between schools, and it, yeah. it comes down to the the strength of leadership um, yeah. in in various schools. Um, any? Do you have any thoughts on any yeah. of that? Yeah, I you know I I I think we all do at top. We believe in uh, you know it's all about listening to the experts, and some of those experts are the teachers who are working on the ground, and there are experts who are studying it, but then there are experts who are actually in it. And you know, I don't think the politicians or indeed the ministry, um, you know, the bureaucrats are in a place to t be telling teachers exactly what they need to be learning and how and where. What, what we want to do at top is to create a more collaborative model between the schools. So, you know, none of this competition between schools. We want schools working together, whether it's in their communities or, or even outside of their communities with other schools that are like-minded, however that works for schools. We want schools working together and we want teachers working together. And, you know, the cream will float to the top. You know, the good PD will, will get engaged with by the teachers, by the schools who who identify the sorts of things that they want to, to be learning about. So it's, I don't, certainly don't see it as politicians coming in and telling teachers what they should be learning, but mm. more about, yeah, teachers and schools and communities working together to go, hey, this one's a good one, this one, you know, and enabling yeah. that to, and, and, then, and then investing in it. So one of the things we want to do, and, and it will be a phased approach, is to phase out or dismantle Aero and put that money savings and bureaucracy into quality PD. Mm. And that will shift the culture over time away from the co compliance and into the teaching and learning, which is where mm. we want it to go. So, yeah. you know... And, and, sorry, and, and I mean, and you would... The, the, relating to the point about leadership, I mean, leadership is is important in schools um but i think it's worth relating it to the point that you made about 
the fact that the, the competitive model, model gets schools operating in silos. And that's why leadership is so important in the current model. Whereas if schools were collaborating more, uh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the school, leadership of each school probably wouldn't be so important in, in terms of the PD that was happening there. Is that a fair thing? Well, to say? yeah, possibly. I mean, anecdotally, this isn't anything that I've read in the research, but anecdotally, I have heard that some of the people who have got themselves into leadership positions in schools are there because they are so good at the compliance side and getting all those boxes ticked and, they look, and it all looks really good. But then you've got a lot of teachers on the staff who are just, you know, tearing their hair out because they know what the nature of learning is and that doesn't fit well with this model and this system that we've created literally over 30 to 40 years, again, under both governments. So, you know, both National and Labour. So, yeah, yeah so, what, so, you know, we see that and what we want to do is shift that and it will take time, it is a vision, but we mm. want to shift that away from the compliance and into the actually what's the you know, the, the crux and the core of learning, because that's the purpose of education is to facilitate learning. Yeah, That's yeah, what we're there for. You'd think so. Hey, um, I've got a Patsy question here for you, Naomi, now from Jenny. Looking forward to hearing about your ECE policy. So that's an, a nice open-ended one for you to talk about uh, ECE. Anything anything that you didn't cover in your introduction that you think is, is really yes. important to get across? Yes, so yes, we haven't really touched on ACE yet. So now, so don't get me wrong, I think there are some wonderful centres doing wonderful things for children, their families and their communities, both private and community orientated centres out there doing fantastic things. However, I mean, people are saying the sector's in, Christ, in a state of crisis and parts of the sector definitely uh, could be considered to be part in a state of crisis because... We've had this corporatization of early childhood education where the purpose of owning a centre is to pay money out to shareholders. So that dividend motive, coupled with some policy decisions that have been made based on zero evidence, have led to some quite shocking unintended consequences in some areas of the sector. So we've had children you know, spending long hours in noisy, overcrowded, stressful settings. And by some estimates, this is a pre-COVID estimate, I'm, I'm not entirely, the, the, it, we're too, it's too, but ha we haven't had time to gather the evidence of what has happened since COVID and lockdown, but the pre-COVID estimates are that around a quarter of our early childhood centres could have been actively harming our children. People have been talking about our most vulnerable citizens being factory farmed. And that, as I said, was, you know, the regulations aren't great. And so when you've got a dividend motive and you're operating at those minimum regulations as, as much as you possibly can, then that's, that's what's created that situation. So let's not go back to that, is what mm. we're saying at top. Mm. So what does the evidence show? The evidence shows that the most important factor in a child's development is warm, consistent, reciprocal, one-to-one -one relationships. Mm. Now, it's quite a complex sector, and hence our 50-page early childhood policy. Uh, people might like to just read the summary pages. But, you know, I, we think we could be doing better. We're quite lucky in New Zealand. There are a range of service offerings in early childhood education that we can be looked at. And some of them have been marginalised by policy in the past. So what we want to do at top is bring back that sense of community, that community oriented early childhood, like we were talking about before. What does that look like? It looks like private organisations who have a good integration with their communities, home-based care, play centre, kōhanga reo, other community oriented centres, kindergartens, even play groups, which ease the isolation for parents in those early years, um, you know, are to be valued in this space. So we would still value quality. We would also value, you know, the nature of parents and teachers working together to develop our children. Another big change, if, we, if we're talking about ECE that we want to make is we want to shift the licensing over to quality-based contracting. So at the moment, 
if you own an ECE, you can have up to 150 over two-year-olds and 75 under two-year-olds under one license. So that's one of the minimum regulation criteria that has caused a bit of a disaster in this sector. Um, the others are mainly space allocation and ratios. So when I shift to a quality-based contracting model, that will enable the ministry to uh, you know, deal to some of those more substandard services more mm. quickly than they currently can. Um, because, I mean, there is there has been an awful lot of poor error reports, haven't there, that, 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 but nothing seems to happen. Well, you can only lose your licence if you're, you know, breaking the law. So, right, you, right. Yeah, so you so, can be, you can be crap, but but as as long as you, as as long as you're not, uh, as long as you're not breaking the law, you don't. <laughs> well, well that's, that's shocking. You can go onto a provisional license, but there's stuff around. Um, there's stuff around. Um, you know, they don't have to even tell their parents, the parents of the children that are in their place, that they're on a provisional license. So God. you know, there's lots, there's lots to be fixed in in that whole space, and and you know. Yeah, my view is um, we know why we're there. We know where we want to be. And it's about, you know, sh um, closing that gap. Mm. Yeah, it really is a journey in, in that one. Just on that, just while we're on ECE, um, <clears throat> a question from uh, Yufan is saying, I would like to see the education system treat all teachers the same, not ECE different not not yes. not ECE teachers different with primary school teachers. I think ECE teachers play the most important role uh, yes. in the humans education stages, but they've been left on the shelf in the education system. Any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, I do have thoughts on that. I have thoughts on most things, Jeff. Um, <laughs> I know some of these are patsy questions, but you know it's good. I know. No, it's a very, <laughs> no, it's a very valid question. It's a really important question, and if you listen to Nathan Wallace. That's why he says Nathan Wallace, neuroscience educator, is like, actually, those early years are the most important because that's when the brain is developing the fastest. And that yeah. is when all of those experiences are so crucial because after a certain age, the brain starts to prune away anything that, you know, isn't that they haven't experienced. So it's, it is so crucial. And the relationship stuff, what we talked about before, is so crucial. In terms of teachers being treated equally, absolutely, totally agree. If you've got two teachers and they've got the same degree and they've got the same experience or whatever, then of course they should be paid the same in the system. Of course they should. The challenge that we're facing, and, and, it, and it came through um, with the COVID recovery payouts, because the challenge that we're facing, and, and if someone's got an easy answer to this, I would love to hear it. Because when, when you put the money into teacher salaries in early childhood, from what I can tell, there's no guarantee that that's going to land in teachers' pockets. Um, it could end up in debt shareholder dividends. And I think that that's the challenge that the sector is facing. Because when they did the um, COVID recovery payout for getting teachers all paid at the minimum at a station rate. Some of that money, which was supposed to be going into teachers' pockets, ended up being, you know, used for operational costs, etc. So right. that's the challenge. My understanding is that because there's a differential in the way that they have to report to government on their finances, I think that's I think that's the part that needs fixing. So they all should be reporting to government on all of their finances and exactly what's going on there. Um, but yeah, certainly if someone's got a better, easier answer, get in touch, that'd be great. Yeah, as we say in uh, economics, money is fungible. So if you're only reporting on part of your funding, then uh, you can you can uh, quite easily manipulate that. Hmm. Um, yeah, so, that, so well, that, that's a good um, covering of early childhood uh, education. There may, be, there may be more questions coming down, uh, coming down the line, but, um, but we, can, um, we can start to, you know, start to move back across the, um, the, the rest of the, of the education spectrum now. We, um, we, well... Uh, did, did you? The, my last point that I didn't. Oh touch yeah, on, good. Okay, yeah, no, um, yeah, yeah. Cover, cover if, it off. That's if good. you want to, uh, if you want to talk about it here, is around um, the universal basic income. Obviously, one of our key policies that will give teachers and families, uh, you know, more choice 
basic level of dignity and security, which after all is what our children need. So for those yeah. who are listening who are unaware of our universal basic income policy, we are proposing $250 a week per adult and $40 a week per child uh, forever until they're 65 when they go into superannuation. And um, we've found four ways to pay for it. So it's totally affordable New Zealand. We can do this and it will enable more choice for our families. There are lots of other benefits of a UBI in terms of closing the welfare trap and providing youth with a platform on from which to make their life decisions. When we're talking here about ECE and, and parents and childhood and child development, um, you know, that UBI will be huge for yeah. enabling both teachers and families to have more choice. And that's crucial, right? Because actually parents are the first teachers. And I think, I mean, that it's it's a bit of a um, it's a bit of a cliche to say that, but I, th I think that point isn't made enough. And in fact, the more we learn as everything you've been saying about early childhood development, the more we learn about it, the more we find out that 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 that, 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 that initial bond between parent and child is is all the more important. So the UBI enabling parents to make that choice to spend more time with their children really is crucial. Yeah, and, and like we talked about before, it's that one-to-one -one reciprocal relationship. So in some families, it won't be that the parents can stay at home, but they might find, you know, an auntie or a grandmother or another, you know, a home-based carer who builds that relationship with that child and is going to see them through until they go to school. You know, it's that consistent relationships instead of what's going on at the moment is, you know, children in these um, centres and then there's such a high teacher turnover. So even if in the, in the mayhem of the regulations as they are, a child and a teacher is able to create a special bond you know there's so much turnover and so what happens to those children when you know and but fair play to the teachers they're in some pretty dire working conditions as well so yeah. it's just yeah. a big fat mess yeah yeah um so moving on uh there's been a few questions about if i'm just i'm just pulling out a theme here there's been a few questions about bullying some talking about bullying in the playground, but some talking about bullying in the staff room as well. I don't know if you have any any thoughts on uh, how we deal with, with bullying in general. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, this is another um, sort of roll-on effect of the, of the system that we have created uh, where teachers aren't valued for uh, what they bring to these centres and to the children. So there's, I mean, yeah, it's just a big mess. But in terms of, you know, what we can be doing in terms of the centres themselves is at the moment, you don't have to have any qualification in order to own an early childhood centre. And, you know, we, we're questioning that. We're like, well, you know, because then the people who own it have, you know, have the power over the staff. And there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the sector to the staff, between the staff. Basically, our whole policy is around an ethic of care. So creating a system that cares for the teachers so that the teachers can then care and educate the children is so important. And caring between the early childhood centre and the families and the communities. Mm. So, you know, it's a big shift. But absolutely, mm. I'm fully aware of the bullying situation that is going on. And it's like you said before, Jeff, you know, if people are, if the if the teachers are bullying each other and people are feeling unhappy and and stressful and tension, the kids pick up on that as well. So it's not mm. good for anybody. So there's a lot that needs fixing. And that's right. Yeah. And and does that same uh, I'm assuming that same sort of uh, issue plays through into into primary and secondary as well. I mean, uh, um, I mean, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I imagine the, the the pressure to get good results under the, the sort of the testing paradigm uh, probably uh, creates a lot of that that pressure and and desire for, um, w w you know, which which might result in a desire for bullying. I mean, um, 
possibly, I, I, to be honest, I'll be honest, I'm not as aware of um, that stuff going on as much in our schools as it is um, going on in um, some of these. Not all of them, as I said before, some of them are fantastic and they really have the children and their development at the heart and they are really doing wonderful things and that's both private and community. That doesn't mm. matter. When the child and their development is at the heart of the centre, you know, everyone's working together to develop these children and everyone's generally feeling pretty good about themselves. So it's more these ones that are, that aren't, you know, that don't have the child and their development at the heart of the, of their um, practice that, mm. you know, and poor teachers finding themselves in these situations when really, again, they've started a profession because they care about the kids <clears throat> and then they yeah. find themselves in these situations. It's really sad. Yeah. Uh, on a similar note, I had a question, how are we going to promote quality leadership in schools? Any thoughts on that? Yes. So, I mean, the whole point of our education policy is to, is to invest in the professional development of our teachers, including our leadership. And so just raising the bar of the whole profession and as I said before, some of that will be in, you know, quality PD courses that have been identified by teachers that they want to go on. And some of it will be in round a coaching sort of model. You know, really the education sector needs to take ownership of that, what's going to work for them and how they want to play it out. But our point is that we want to invest in the profession, take away the compliance side, enable teachers to actually do their jobs. And, mm. and absolutely, that includes the leadership. And when the leaders have been put into a place because they're so wonderful at the compliance side of things, there's an opportunity there for those leaders to also learn and grow and understand about the depth of what learning really constitutes and, and you know, why we're educating, facilitate learning. Mm, yes. I've got a curly one for you and then a nice patsy one to bring you back, um, Naomi. Uh, one question from Alex. What's your policy regarding free speech, especially at university? Are you for or against censorship and cancel culture? Oh, that's a really good question. Thank you very much, <laughs> Alex. So I think that universities are a place for uncomfortable conversations to take place. Yeah. That is, you know, one of the base purposes of university to enable uncomfortable conversations to take place, but that does have to be in a, you know, in a system of respect and, mm. um, you know, honouring that what you're saying, impacting on others and being reflective of that because universities are also a place for reflection and changing your mind and, uh, you know, understanding those core assumptions that are, that, uh, that may be driving you forward, et cetera. So challenging those dominant discourses as well. So, mm. you know, I think that's, that's all, you know, packaged up together in terms of mm. the, the role of university in our society. It yeah. does need to be made sure that it's being done in a respectful way. And yes, I, I guess what, what we don't want is just more dominant discourse, right? I feel like we've had enough dominant discourse. Really, we want more of the, you know, the other side of the discourse to be challenging what what we all assume to be the truth yeah absolutely and and i i i just do i do worry that if if uh if debate is being shut down um that you know that does make me worry about the future of our of our universities um bronwyn asking a great question um well it starts with a statement but gets into a question uh, yes, we need better ratio and space requirements in ECE, which I think you've talked about. Um, and we need people to need to allow people to open bush kindergartens. Yes. What would that require? We so, so, so need bush kindergartens. We're, we're fully on board with that. I used to, before I came to top, I volunteered for a, an organisation which was 100% free play in nature holiday programs. All of my boys went on them. It was so awesome. Um, so I'm all <laughs> over. I'm so all over that. I mean, they just came home so naked from playing freely in nature, sliding down mudslides and climbing trees and having a great time. <laughs> yeah, and, great. Uh, yeah, so I'm definitely all over. And it's so good for children. They need to be 
you know, connecting with themselves and others in nature and connecting to nature itself, of course. And it's so good for them and holistically and so many things. So, yeah, absolutely. Fully on board with that. And I think, I mean, there was a petition that went to government for bush kindergartens and it seems to have stalled. Um, again, I think, the, I think the profession can come up with how they want that to look. You know, the, right. those are the people who are on the ground who understand this stuff and need, and know how it works. I mean, the one that I've witnessed was a, you know, for school age kids. But for example, we did a boundary walk. So we're like, okay, this is the boundary, everybody. If you want to go out and there's no fences or anything, we just did a boundary walk. This is where you're allowed to go. And then if you go outside that once, you get one warning. And if you step over it again, you're going home. And no one wanted to go home because they had such a good time. And then, <laughs> and then if you did want to go down and explore it, then you could go to a teacher, one of the adults, and say, can we take, can we go and have a look? And so then a group, you know, to keep the ratios, et cetera, a group could go and, ha- and explore that area. So it's totally doable. And So and is, that, pro- is that sort of managing the sort of health and safety side yeah. of that? Because I imagine that's what, that's what puts people off from doing that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 So, so there is, um, you know, there, there are ways to manage this. That's a one example, but there are ways to manage that stuff. And, you know, the center I went to also had an outdoor, um, an outdoor um, session as well. The ratios were very good, obviously being a play center. There's other places that I've heard of that where there is bush kindergartens, it's happening. And, I, I think that the system needs to enable that stuff rather than shutting it down and saying, no, that's too yeah. dangerous. I think we need to, yes, we do need to be prudent and we need to make sure that our children are safe in the environments. But actually, in my experience, children are pretty good at keeping themselves safe. And the earlier that you expose them to risk, the better they become at keeping mm. themselves safe. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, the, uh, we had fires. We had fires at our play centre and, you know, you got one and a half year old standing there and, yeah, you had to just keep reminding them it's hot, hot, hot. But, you know, it, it's it, they, they, it's amazing what they learn when they're exposed to this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, classic. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm lucky. I grew up in Okaiha, so, you know, had a, had a completely uh, free range childhood. So, you know, and, and, I, and I agree, you know, you, you, you learn pretty quick to um, you know, what things you have to watch out for. Mm. Um, <clears throat> from Bronwyn, interested in your thoughts on this. With the UBI, you might see a less demand for ECE services. Is that a good or a bad thing? Well, I mean, I think we, it's fair to say that from trials around the world, um, one of the impacts of UBI, as we've talked about for Jeff, but just for those who are watching who haven't heard about it before, there's been trials done all around the world. Usually when a workforce or a, you know, a population get a UBI, most people continue to work, some work more. The two groups that don't are youth who retrain and parents who want to spend more time with their children. So that may well be a situation that happens and then you know that's beneficial to society going forward. What I would say in terms of the evidence and the child development, there have been studies that have said children spending time in early childhood education results in better outcomes later in their life. Absolutely. There is nothing that no study has said more hours equals better outcomes. And there have been recent studies that say too many hours have been detrimental to the behavior of the children. And obviously, if the behavior is going downhill, then there is other background stuff that's happening for those kids. So I think we just need to rethink what do we want early childhood to look like in New Zealand? And again, as I said before, there are a range of options. We're lucky in this country that we still have a range of options available to us. Some places overseas, it's all gone down the just the privatization, corporatization route. But you know, what, how do we want these kids to be growing up? Yes, some early childhood is, is um, beneficial. And certainly in those community orientated places where they've got strong relationships with their teachers and the teachers know the parents and the parents are working and, and the community is connected. You know, great, that's awesome. When, when we've got kids spending 10 hours a day 
five days a week in overcrowded, noisy, stressful settings where there's not enough space for them to run around and no quiet place for them to sit and reflect and think. I th that's detrimental to the future of our society. And I think that needs to be challenged. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So um, we've only got a few minutes left and uh, uh, lots and lots of, of questions and, and comments flying through. So apologies to all of the ones that we uh, don't get through. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I will, um, these, I'll go these are all, right these are all, yeah, these are all online for you to, for you to see Naomi. So yeah. that's, that's cool. Um, yeah. <clears throat> one interesting point here, um, about parents that haven't had the exposure to effective parenting. Uh, and is there a, an aspect of parental learning in your policy? I mean, yeah. I think that's, that's kind of what you're talking about with the, with the community-based early childhood education, if I'm, if I'm yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly what our policy talks about, is that there's an opportunity for early childhood to grow whole communities. And the integration stuff that I'm talking about, where there's integration between early childhood centres and families and communities, that's exactly where that comes in. And there's a whole chapter with examples both in New Zealand and overseas where that stuff is working really well. So in New Zealand at the moment, we and, and the evidence shows that when parents and children are learning and growing together through this process, you know, that's, that's the best outcome overall. So in New Zealand at the moment, yes, there are parenting courses and there is placing to where parents take the children and get that um, education and child development. And, but, but we've had... Year, decades of policy that has divided, has created a parent-teacher divide in our early childhood education sector. And really, I guess what we're trying to do is bring that back together. And that mm. will look different in, in different settings and different services, but the under, underlying principle is absolutely that children and parents grow together through this experience. Mm. I mean, and we know, and we know from all of the... Sorry, we know from all of the evidence that, that that in early childhood and right through primary school is, is one of the most, uh, one of the biggest determinants of, of how, uh, you know, of how well kids flourish, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was just going to say I've, I've grown a lot through my parenting journey so far. Have you? I have indeed. What's, you the, what's the biggest me. thing it's what's the biggest thing it's me. taught you uh patience and tolerance you think <laughs> i'm impatient when you don't answer my emails jeff you should have seen me <laughs> all right well, okay well uh, i thank goodness you've had uh three three <laughs> boys then <laughs> no I, I can i can uh i can certainly imagine that that that's that that's the case um yeah, no, and, and and I guess that just brings us back full circle to the to the point of of lifelong learning, right? And we are increasingly entering an age where we will all need to keep learning. Um, we want our teachers to be learning, we want our kids to be learning, we want our adults to be learning, and <clears throat> that's all about, um, I guess, being open, being open to that, having the humility to know that. None of us have got all of the all of the answers, and there's always uh, some some areas to grow. Absolutely, and, and like I said at the start, education is the life pulse of our society, and it has the power to change our society. And you know, we we here at Top are very concerned about some of the stuff that is happening in this election cycle, and you know, education has the power to you know to change that. For, for the future, for the future of New Zealand. And I think, yeah. you know, not to bring it too back to politics, but I think if people, and remember, this is a vision, you know, this is, this is the vision for New Zealand's future. And it, and it will take time. We, we don't create policy, as I said before, but some people might have come on since I started. We don't create policy to tinker at the edges uh, based on a three-year election cycle. At top, we do thorough research and we look at the problem deeply and we create policy that will drive New Zealand forwards over time. And so if we want this 
you know, if we want this community ECE or compliance, less compliance, more better professional development education system in New Zealand going forwards, then we need people to be talking about top, talking to their mates. You know, if Colmar Brunt Brunton ring you up, just say you're going to vote top, even if you're not really sure, because we need higher polling <laughs> so we can get on the blooming debates. You know, We've got a few power structure things going on here in the background team. So, yeah, we just need people to be talking about top and about how we're trying to bring vision to all areas of New Zealand's biggest problems. Um, tonight, we're talking about education. Yeah. And look, Naomi, I really want to acknowledge you for, for all of the work you've put in to, you know, particularly the early childhood education policy. I know, as you say, you put uh, 18 months into that. Um, and then for stepping up to be a candidate too, because, uh, you know, I think um, you've, you've really grown into that role. And it's, uh, you know, I, as, as you sort of intimated earlier on in the conversation, I know it was a, it was a, a big step for you to make, but Thank you for, for, for stepping up. And I know it must be hugely challenging to do that with, um, with three little kids. I certainly um, don't, don't think I'd be able to do it myself if I, if I was, wouldn't be able to do this if I was looking after three kids. So thanks so much for, for, for stepping up and, uh, and for, for all your hard work and passion and dedication. And there's lots of people thanking you on the live stream as well oh, because your you. your passion is very clear. Thank you. Well, as a you know, as you know, Jeff, uh, I'm you know this is about the future for my children and their peers. So you know that's that's why I'm doing it. Yep. And uh, and say hi to the boys for me tomorrow morning. Oh yes, and one of them has got a speech this week, and he has to speak about someone famous, and he's chosen you, Jeff. <laughs> I think you need to teach him what famous means. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to film it and send it to you. He's really oh, funny. Oh, great. Awesome. Hey, well, thank okay. you so much for your time, Dr. Naomi Pocock. Um, and thanks everyone for, for watching and for all your amazing questions. Um, uh, as Naomi said, she'll do her best to get into the stream afterwards and answer any ones that we haven't, but we've actually done pretty well, Naomi, and getting through a whole bunch of questions. So, um, Good work. Kaki te ano.